We're so honored today to have a very special guest with us, the newly elected and yet at the same time longest serving prime minister in the history of Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Mr. Prime Minister, congratulations and welcome. Well, thank you. And good to be with such a good friend and such good friends of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Well, we love you and we love Israel. You know, you have written your autobiography, a fascinating book entitled Bibi, My Story. And you not only tell your story, but you also tell the story of the nation of Israel. And so many Americans and people around the world have bought into the lie perpetrated by the liberal media that Israel didn't come into existence until 1948, and it occupies land that really they stole from the Palestinians. I love what you do in the book. You show how world history and archaeology debunk that lie. Can you just share with our audience what evidence there is that Israel has belonged in that land for 3,500 years? Well, you know, it uh, starts with a, a book called the Bible, which I think <laughs> your audience is familiar with. And yes. the Bible describes roughly the, the first uh, 2,000 years of uh, uh, the Jewish people's connection to the land from the time of Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the Jewish people. Uh, and that is the, uh, uh, began around 3,500 years ago. Uh, and that, the Bible continues roughly to the, uh, uh, you know, the middle of the tw second, third century uh, before the Common Era. Uh, so, uh, you know, when the Jews come back from the exile in Babylon, they build the, the temple once again. It's that same temple where Jesus visited and overturned the money table, the, the money changers table. Where did that happen? In China? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the attempt, and, and of course, then we were occupied by the Romans who destroyed the, the temple, the second temple. Uh, and we still lived in the land for, uh, uh, as the majority uh, population there for another six, seven centuries until the Arab conquest. It's actually only with the Arab conquest in the seventh century that the Jews, uh, the land begins to be depopulated, replaced by the Arab conquerors. Uh, but they didn't do much with the land. It lies fallow and uh, really barren. Uh, and up to the 19th century, when such uh, visitors like Mark Twain uh, describe the land in its uh, barrenness, and he basically says, "I'm, you know, basically, uh, I'm not quoting him, but I'm paraphrasing." He says, "So when will the Jews come back to bring it back to life?" And we do, in the 19th century, uh, reconstitute the land, reconstitute our sovereignty. Uh, a lot of Arabs from nearby lands also uh, immigrate at that time to the burgeoning population centers, to the farms, to the factories that we built not unlike what happens in many countries with immigration today. Uh, and uh, many of them now are called ancient Palestinians. Uh, you know, uh, So history has been rewritten. Modern history has been rewritten, rewritten with falsehoods. And the most amazing thing is ancient history is being rewritten. We've been attached to this land for millennia uh, in an attachment that is unparalleled by any people in any other nation. And certainly not, uh, no people has suffered so much and shed so much, an ocean of tears and blood to regain back our ancestral homeland, the land of Israel, the land of Zion. And I talk about that, obviously, but this is yes. what informs my mission, uh, which I described. Uh, uh, my grandfather, who was a rabbi, my father was a great historian of the Jewish people. My older brother, who gave his life to defend, a, uh, to extricate Jewish hostages from the heart of Africa. Uh, and my own uh, mission, which has been to assure the permanence, uh, the prosperity and security of the state, the Jewish state, the one and only Jewish state. Once we've recovered, we're not going to let anyone uh, break the dream of uh, centuries, the ingathering of the exile, the reconstitution of Israel. So I, I think all of that is woven into my personal story, obviously. Yes. I'm glad it affords the opportunity to debunk all these uh, slanders and vilification against Israel and the Jewish people. Mr. Prime Minister, I'm preaching to our people uh, 
the story of Abraham and the history of Abraham. And of course, the Abrahamic covenant included this promise. God said, I will bless those who bless you and your descendants. I will curse those who curse you. So I believe there's a spiritual reason for us to support you and the nation of Israel. But to those who don't believe the Bible, those Americans uh, in our country who don't accept the Abrahamic covenant, can you share briefly just some practical geopolitical reasons that America needs to continue to staunchly defend Israel? Well, I, I think that America has no better ally than Israel, and Israel has no better ally than America. And it's an alliance bred not only of interests, but of values. We are the bastion of Western civilization, of our Judeo-Christian heritage in the heart of the Middle East. And the Middle East, as you know, is not a particularly friendly place. It is, uh, unfortunately, uh, peppered with uh, radical Islamists who chant death to Israel and death to America. They yeah. see Israel as basically a, uh, we are the little Satan and you're the great Satan. We're, we sort of stand in their way. They'd like to conquer the Middle East. Uh, they'd like to build weapons, uh, including in the case of Iran, uh, atomic weapons and the means to deliver them to you. And what is preventing them is us. <laughs> We're here. That's right. Um, uh, one friend of mine, uh, a very good, great friend of Israel, uh, a senator, a southern senator in the United States, uh, said, I wish we had another Israel in the eastern part of the Middle East, say, where Afghanistan is, because then instead of investing a trillion dollars, we'd invest a few billion a year, uh, a fraction of that, and we would still be there and still strong. Uh, so I, I think that Israel is holding the... Uh, basically holding the Middle East together and preventing the uh, radical Islamists who are rabid anti-Americans from capturing this strategic place, which is the crossroads of the world, uh, and, but also preventing them from developing the weapons of mass, mass death that would threaten not only us, but you as well. Yeah. And I think people, people understand that. I, I wish I could go into the amount of intelligence sharing that we uh, share with the United States the, the many American lives that we have saved because of this superior intelligence. But in many other ways, in these and many other ways, Israel is the best friend the United States can have. In the Middle East, I say in the world. Absolutely. And of course, by necessity, you have stayed out of U.S. politics. You incurred support from Israel from both sides of the aisle. And yet in your book, and this is fascinating to me, you don't hold back in describing your relationship with various U.S. presidents. Uh, would you mind just sharing, contrasting your relationship with President Clinton, President Obama, and President Trump, and also tell us uh, any relationship you have with Joe Biden? Look, I think there is a, a, an alliance between us that crosses administrations, and uh, both in Israel and in the United States. Uh, Israel is the one country in the world that all, virtually the entire political spectrum is pro-American. You, you, we've never wavered, never faltered on that. Uh, but of course, we, there can be differences of opinion, uh, principally because we're here uh, in the, if you will, in the center of the cauldron, and you're thousands of miles away, so naturally we can see things differently. Uh, whenever I had differences that I thought could affect Israel's security, I, I didn't hesitate to uh, stand up for what I thought was uh, vital interests of Israel's security. Uh, and I did that, by the way, with Republican and Democratic uh, presidents alike. Uh, with President Clinton, uh, you know, I had uh, differences on the Palestinians because I think that I think in many ways, uh, successive U.S. presidents, not only President Clinton, uh, didn't read the Palestinian issue correctly. First, they thought that it was the central issue in the Middle East. If we only make peace with the between Israel and the Palestinians, this is the heart of the conflict, always in the singular, the heart of the conflict in the Middle East. And if we solve that, everything else will fall in place. Well, that's just plain wrong. The reason that that's wrong is because the Middle East is rife with conflicts. Arab against Arab, non-Arabs against uh, Arabs, Shiites against uh, Sunnis, uh, moderates against radicals, you name it. You could take Israel out of here, it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference. I mean, you could put Belgium in here, it would make a difference. <laughs> and Israel could disappear. In fact, it does make a difference, only in the sense that the more radical anti-American elements are uh, held back by the presence of this 
uh, powerful ally that the United States has in the form of Israel. So the first uh, area of, uh, of disagreement was the centrality that people accorded to the Palestinian issue, which is uh, born of uh, myopia and lack of understanding. The second thing is that the uh, people always believe that, okay, to solve the conflict between Israel and the Arab states, you had to first go through the Palestinians, which gave them a veto power. Now that was mm -hmm. uh, that was a mistake for for a number of reasons. The most important one being that the Palestinians don't want peace with Israel; they want a peace instead of Israel, and they don't want a state next to Israel. They want a state uh, in place of Israel. They want to do away with Israel. So we waited for a quarter of a century after signing the seminal peace agreement with Egypt and the subsequent peace agreement with Jordan for 25 years, a quarter of a century, 24 years to be exact, we had no peace treaty because American governments and successive Israeli governments said, well, first we have to go through the Palestinians. Yeah. But you might as well wait another half century because they won't remove the veto. They're not interested in having Israel expand the peace. They want Israel to you know, disappear. Uh, I decided to go against that. And I uh, argued constantly that we can make peace with the Arab states uh, and not wait for the Palestinians. And if anything, it will work the other way around. It's not inside out, first go to the Palestinians, then go to the Arab world. I said, first go to the Arab world and then eventually isolate the Palestinian rejectionists and maybe we'll get a peace, maybe, that we could live with, live with literally and not die with. Uh, that, uh, I broke through on that and only with uh, President Trump. And it also took a little while until I could persuade him of that, but I'm glad he was persuaded. <laughs> Uh, and uh, once we, we went together on this route, we forged four historic peace agreements. Actually, it took four months to do it, uh, obviously with a lot of clandestine meetings uh, before that. But peace with uh, the United Arab Emirates, peace with uh, Bahrain, peace with Morocco, peace with Sudan. And I believe there are many more to come. So uh, I think that was a, different, a second difference that I had uh, and with uh, Presidents Clinton and Obama, and one that I came to an agreement with President Trump with historic consequences. And of course, the main uh, issue of difference between uh, uh, President Obama and myself was on the Iran deal, which I thought was dangerous for Israel, dangerous for America. And I was very glad when President Trump uh, decided to uh, uh, leave the deal and to apply uh, renewed pressure on Iran, which I think is still a challenge before us because you don't want the Ayatollahs to have uh, nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them to every one of your cities. Mr. Prime Minister, the first time I got to shake hands with you was at the historic opening of the embassy in Jerusalem on May 14th, 2018. The great honor of my life was for President Trump to invite me to say the opening prayer. That was a historic day. Can you explain to our people why that was so important to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of your country? Precisely because of the things you started out with, with the great uh, historical uh, amnesia or distortion, <laughs> which uh, said that we have no connection to Jerusalem. Can you imagine people saying, uh, well, Washington is not the capital of the United States, or London is not the capital of uh, Britain, or Paris is not the capital of France. Of course, it's ridiculous. But in the case of Israel, it's uh, doubly absurd because Jerusalem has been our capital for 3,000 years, uh, ever since King David declared it as such 3,000 years ago. And to deny this basic fact is, uh, uh, is, is, is a kind of a, a blindness that uh, gripped uh, much of the international community. And somebody had to, to puncture that, uh, that fallacy and that lie. And I was very glad when President Trump decided to recognize uh, this historical truth by declaring Israel, declaring that the United States recognizes Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Uh, it is our in the, indeed that our eternal united capital, and also move the American embassy there. And in that stellar moment, uh, I was deeply moved to hear your words uh, on behalf of the United States, but also on behalf of uh, believing Christians who always knew this truth and always stood by us. Uh, we have no better friends than our Christian friends in America and around the world, and I, I thank you for that. Well, we're honored to stand with you. I only have two more questions because I know your time is very valuable. But as you assess the current situation and the threats against your country, and you have them coming from every direction, 
which nation do you think poses the great poses the greatest threat to the security of Israel? Is it going to be Iran or Russia? Could you differentiate between the two? Definitely Iran, because Iran is uh, uh, this uh, radical Islamic uh, uh, Ayatollah thuggery. Uh, is, uh, first of all, its real face has now been shown to the world unmasked by the brave men and the extraordinarily brave women of Iran who uh, were facing death and indeed dying in the face of this brutal regime. Uh, and this regime has sworn to eradicate the Jewish state uh, and to develop nuclear weapons to that effect. And I've devoted uh, a good uh, part of my adult life, as I describe in my book, uh, which describes my my experiences as a soldier in an elite unit, as a diplomat, and then uh, as a prime minister, in fending off these forces, and especially Iran. Uh, and Iran remains that most, uh, I would say, the most dangerous of enemies, because we've learned from our history, including recent history, with Nazi Germany, that if somebody says that they're going to kill you, take them seriously. Yes. And we take it seriously. And we've done many things, some of which I describe in my book, not all of them, uh, to um, obviously to uh, fend off this threat. The one thing that I do describe in my book is a, a, a raid, a mission that I authorized the Mossad to carry out in a suburb of Tehran to actually uh, raid Iran's secret atomic archive and bring it back, uh, bring it back to Israel and discover and just discovered all these uh, incredible uh, material that shows how Iran lied when it said we're not trying to develop nuclear weapons and so on. Uh, the story is quite amazing because um, I don't know if you saw this, the, the movie Argo. Uh, yes. This is Argo on super steroids. <laughs> Thousands and thousands of Iranian personnel, security forces, police gave chase to our men, but they managed to get out and bring with them half a ton of material that exposed Iran's lies to the world. So wow. I, I describe some of that and, of course, other things, too. I, <laughs> my own brushes with death several times in my military service. And I've had my brushes with political death. Uh, I've come back yes. with political death twice. I know people came back once. Uh, you know, in the last 75 years, somebody told me nobody in the free world came back twice. So uh, I guess uh, I should thank Providence for that. And well, really Absolutely. And that leads me to my last question. You know, obviously, we have differing views on the Messiah, but we serve the same God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And there are millions of evangelical Christians, Mr. Prime Minister, who pray for you and would like to know specifically, how can we best pray for you, your family, and the nation of Israel? First of all, you have been doing that. And maybe people don't know uh, what you know very well, that the Jewish national movement in modern time Zionism was preceded by Christian Zionism uh, in uh, uh, across the centuries, beginning uh, many centuries ago, including in, in, in England, uh, and then in the United States with uh, evangelical movements that agitated for the establishment of a, of a Jewish uh, homeland and a Jewish state well before uh, our modern Moses, Theodor Herzl, uh, came to the scene in uh, 1896. His best friend was uh, a, Christian, uh, a Christian Zionist pastor who was on his bedside. He was the only one admitted to his bedside when he died tragically at the age of 44. And uh, he was the only one that the family admitted to sit by his bedside. So this bond between Christian Zionists and uh, uh, and uh, the modern Jewish state, the movement to ingather the exiles and reestablish our sovereignty in our ancient homeland, uh, the land of Israel, uh, that is a powerful bond that preceded the modern state of Israel. And now it's being continued by uh, people who both pray and also stand up for Israel. Stand up for Israel with, uh, you know, with your with your uh, representatives, with your uh, uh, representatives in Congress and the Senate, uh, in public opinion. Uh, and by the way, it, do so beyond America. There are uh, Christian Zionists throughout uh, Europe. There are Christian Zionists in Korea, uh, in Nigeria. 
in so many parts uh, in, in Brazil, enormous uh, number. So this is a worldwide force that gives uh, succor, support, and encouragement to the Jewish state. And I, I want to thank you. I want to use this opportunity to thank the many who are listening to us. Encourage you to read my book. You'll perhaps discover some things that will uh, uh, strengthen even further your support for the Jewish state. But I can say that I express my appreciation uh, in uh, many ways. And I always find it fascinating to meet the Christian Zionists and evangelicals who come to Israel. And we talk about our common history, the origins of Christianity, the, the footsteps of Jesus from the Galilee to Jerusalem, which I'm I'm quite intimately familiar with. Uh, it is, uh, <laughs> it is uh, as uh, Pope John Paul once said to me, you know, when I first met him, I was there with my wife. We were very young at the time when I was first elected. He said, you're so young and yet you're leading our, this ancient people. You, the Jews, the Jewish people, he said, are our older brothers and sisters. So, <laughs> so I could say that we are appreciative older brothers and sisters in this young, vibrant Jewish state that shares so much of the values uh, and the hopes of our, our people, our peoples. Yes. And I have to point out, Mr. Prime Minister, that uh, our church, First Baptist Church of Dallas, that I pastor, is a Southern Baptist church. And the first president to recognize Israel as a new nation was a Southern Baptist president named Harry Truman. So we have a great bond with one another. We look forward to seeing you this spring. We have 400 people we're bringing to Israel we look forward to seeing you then. And I would say to our audience, get a copy of this new book, BB, My Story by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It's available in bookstores everywhere and certainly at Amazon.com. Mr. Prime Minister, God bless you and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. And I hope to see you very soon in Israel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.